talk and find free GED classes in your area. GED is a registered trademark of the American Council on Education, brought to you by Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. 7,000 high school students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. So here's a 26 second message of encouragement. Hey, I'm Matt. I know, sometimes you think no one cares if I finish high school, right? Well, I do. Me and thousands of people you've never even met. Okay, here's the thing. When you graduate, you have better opportunities to make more money, have a cool job, you know, just have a better life. So the next time you need a little support, a little motivation, just know there are a whole lot of shoulders for you to lean on. So stay in school and graduate. Do you have 26 seconds to convince a student to stay at their desk? Now you can share your message of support at BoostUp.org. We can keep students in school. Visit BoostUp.org and take the first step. Brought to you by the U.S. Army and the Ad Council. For years, you've struggled with heavy cat hair, and you've found ways to cope. But new cat hair is up to 25% longer with the same number of uses as other clumping layers. New fresh and light, changing the litter, or the second one. Antonio Ribeiro Teles gravava o primeiro fez. 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 Antonio Ribeiro Teles gravava o primeiro fez.
uh, if you go to if you want to go to PayPal and make a donation, Tim at SpookySouthCoast.com. Something tells me we're going to need to be upgrading some of our equipment here. So Tim at SpookySouthCoast.com. Please, we need the money. And uh, also, I noticed that you know I'm having problems with my tablet, trying to type in the chat room. And then we start running the audio off the computer over here, and we can get this Spanish voice talking over things. Uh, so anyway, it's just it's, it's going to be one of those kind of nights. But yeah, we, we knew that when tonight. we signed up for it. A little weird tonight. We knew it was going to happen when we signed up to talk about Amityville, which we will do with our guest tonight, Eric Walter. He's the director of the new film My Amityville Horror. And it's not Eric's Amityville Horror, but it's actually the story of Daniel Lutz, the oldest of the three Lutz children who lived in that home for 28 days and became the basis of the entire Amityville Horror saga of the Lutz family. And just as we had Christopher Quarantino on, who was formerly known as Christopher Lutz before he went back to his birth name, uh, we, we had him on and he shared some stories of what went on inside 112 Ocean Avenue for those 28 days and also how the Amityville Horror has continued to affect his life uh, even today. And the same thing with Daniel Lutz. It, it seems like it's a little bit different of a story uh, and we'll get into the differences as we go on later on tonight but uh, there are a lot of similarities in the story and I'm not talking in terms of what happened I'm just talking about in terms of the effect that it had on these men and, and how they grew up in the shadow of the Amityville house so it's going to be a fascinating discussion I really want to get into uh, some of Eric's thoughts on what Daniel says in the film I had the opportunity this week to watch the film My Amityville Horror and it's definitely a different look at this story. Uh, it's, I'd say it's almost, it, it brings, it humanizes the story. You know, it takes it out of the, the horror movie, scary book realm that it's been in for the past 35 years, and it puts it in the perspective of making you think, gee, this was a family. This was a group of people who had their own issues, had their own hopes and dreams, and, and how the Amityville case affected them uh, so it's when you watch the movie like you really understand uh, what it was like to live in that house and to live with the story of that house for the rest of their lives so we'll talk about all that with uh, our, our guest Eric Walter coming up in just a little bit but uh, Matt I was sharing with you a little bit before the show went on the air yep. some of the experiences we had last week at the Houghton Mansion as part of our Legend Trips event yeah I heard it was wild oh man it is it, I love every place that we investigate, but you know, normally I go away from an event uh, with you know strong feelings about about the location and, and about my experiences there and about you know the, the main thing for me is that everybody has a good time. That's what's important. Everybody yeah. that goes there, well, actually, it's important that everybody stays safe. But on top of that, I want them to also have a good time. And even if they don't have a paranormal encounter, I want them to go, go away from this event saying, gee, you know, at least I had an entertaining evening. And that's normally what my thought process is. But going into this, I was really fired up to get into the Houghton Mansion because I'd heard so much about it. But now it's stuck with me more than any location that we've ever done any of these events at. I've thought about it so much over the past week. I actually missed being there. And uh, I definitely feel like it's it's kind of calling me back. And I've been talking with some of our fellow legend trippers, and they all seem to seem feel the same way. You know, if uh, if you check out some of the pace, uh, posts they put up on Facebook and yeah. and other social media, you know, it's uh, they miss it. They want to go back. <laughs> and if it wasn't four hours away, I'd be there right now. Yeah. Because that's just how amazing it was. And uh, I did write a blog on uh, on wbsm.com about my personal experiences there, but I'll, I'll just sum it up real quickly for everybody here on the radio. Uh, we had a tour the night before for the people who uh, joined us for the two night portion of the event. And uh, we got to walk around and see the inside of it with a, a personal private tour from Josh Mantello of Berkshire Paranormal Group who are headquartered in the mansion. And as he was taking us around just on this tour, sharing with us some of the stories of what happens where we actually heard disembodied voices. Uh, not once, but twice. We heard it on the third floor. Uh, it sounded like it was coming out of a closet, but there was no devices or anything in the closet that would make any kind of uh, noises like that. And then we heard it again when we were on the first floor, and we were standing in the stairway area listening upstairs. We could hear voices. So it was uh, it was already active before we even brought everybody in for the event. And then normally, you know, when you bring a significant amount of people into a haunted location, there's a chance that you're going to dampen the effect of some of the activity, but that was not the case. One Saturday came, 
and everybody let loose on the investigation. Uh, it was one of the most paranormally active nights mm -hmm. we've ever had doing these events. Well, the, and, house, the house itself is huge, isn't it? Oh, it's immense. And every time I went there, I went there three times over the course of the weekend, and each time I went there, I found new rooms that I had never found before. Yeah. And, and Josh said it literally took him like a year to stop like finding nooks and crannies of the house uh, that he had never explored before. And the Psycho Man game was amazing. I didn't have a chance to go in there uh, because everybody that attended the event wanted to go and have a moment yeah. uh, in that. And, and people were coming out very affected by what happened. I mean, even, even Dave Schrader, uh, who was our guest from Darkness Radio, he left having an emotional, personal experience in that Psycho Man team that, that he couldn't explain, but that he, he was glad that he had. Uh, and, and that seems to be the, the story that a lot of people came out of it with. You know, it's like, uh, I'm glad I went in there. I didn't want to do it or, you know, I didn't think anything was going to happen, but I'm glad that I went in there because it was it affected people so personally. And that's what happened to me with my experience that I had uh, on the third floor of the, the Mason Hall uh, that's attached to the mansion. I, I mean, the only way to put it is I shook hands with a ghost. And I wrote about it on the blog at, at WBSM.com so you can check it out to get the whole story. But I will say this, it changed me as an investigator. Really? I'm no longer going to go running into these things like I have in the past with, you know, uh, you know, guns blazing, you know, come on out. Yeah. We want you to Did come out. Show yourself. Like uh, you have more of a respect for whatever is on the other side. I do because I had a I guess the only way to put it is I had a, a human moment with a ghost. Uh, you know, I, I had uh, a connection with a spirit yeah. where, and I, I never had that. Before. Where there's some sort of intelligence behind it is. Yeah. It definitely Almost. seemed, yeah, it definitely seemed to be, or at least, I, I don't know if I'll say necessarily an intelligence behind it, but there was an emotion behind it. Yeah. And I've long thought that, you know, as much as I throw out a lot of these theories that I think are kind of part and parcel with talking about the paranormal, uh, you know, that these are things that we create with our own mind, they are, you know, they're manifestations of our own beliefs, you know, they're just leftover electrical activity, whatever kind of way you want to categorize yeah. it, I've always been... Uh, against the idea that it's the soul of a deceased person. That just doesn't make as much sense to me as some of these other theories. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way that I've been able to categorize a ghost in recent years is I feel that a ghost is an emotion. Yeah. And it's... Do you feel like that's why it's such a... <clears throat> Such a like a um, a moving experience for a lot of people? I think because so. Because it's, it's that conveying of emotion from the disembodied spirit to... In the physical form and it's it, exactly and it's it's exactly that it's not even that the emotion has an intelligence behind it mm -hmm. it's just that it it exists and it's out there and you have to put logic aside in order to experience that emotion to some degree i mean obviously you want to stay logical within the moment but you have to kind of think outside what we've been told and what we've learned to have that experience and you know when somebody pulls out a device and they want to measure a ghost to me, it's starting to look no different than, you know, would you pull out a, a millimeter, an EMF detector, or, or a K2 to try to measure love, yeah. to try to measure anger? You know, uh, these these experiences that are palpable in the air when we experience them, the, the, the energy that you can feel in a room when an emotion is conveyed, that's kind of what a ghost seems like to me. And that's definitely what this experience was. And it, it I mean, definitely changed things for me. It would make sense if uh, a spirit would leave some sort of imprint. It would be an emotion. Yeah, and that's what I think that we're encountering. Um, Especially if there was, let's say, like a tragedy, like at the Houghton. If um, the, what happened, the, uh, the guy there was killed a, himself after a car yeah, accident? Yeah, after the car accident, the driver went out to the barn and, and, and killed himself. Uh, and then A.C. Houghton died uh, about nine days later, I think, or yeah. 11 days later. And, uh, no, nine days later, on the 11th. And uh, the yeah, that imprint of it, though, as negative as that story is, the activity doesn't seem to have that negativity. It seems to be very positive, uh, very benign, very, very benevolent, mm -hmm. except in Witter's room where there is kind of a, a, a negative force. And, you know, normally you know me. That's what I encounter when I investigate. You know, yep, I yep. go up, I butt heads with whatever the, the dark side of the, the investigation is, but... Not in this case, and I think that I'm going to go into it with a different perspective and a different point of view. 
So you can read about that on WBSM.com. Just go to the uh, to the post there for the show host blogs and go down for Spooky, or go to the shows too uh, for Spooky South Coast, and you can find it there. And it's also linked up on the front page of SpookySouthCoast.com if you want to read about it. And I, I do hope that you do because uh, it's it's going to be something that becomes a reference point for me, I think, going forward. You know, that's, it's, that's the game changer for me. And uh, we also have uh, numerous Legend Trips events that we're putting together. Uh, we're actually in discussions with a couple of different locations and trying to hammer out dates. But we'll be coming back here to New Bedford sometime in the summer uh, for Fort Tabor. They're in the works of securing the date for us for that. And uh, I know that uh, one person uh, in the chat room will be happy to know that it's it's uh, we're working on hopefully June for that. And uh, then also we're in discussions with a few other places. So we'll have more information forthcoming. Don't forget, if you want to get on the mailing list, go to legendtrips.com. Because if you're not on the Legend Trips mailing list, you cannot get uh, the exclusive pre-sale access to those events. You, and, and we've got Dead of Summer coming up at Lizzie Borden's. Mm -hmm. That will definitely be taking place sometime in August. And when that happens, uh, you know that those sell out in pre-sale. So yeah, they do. I can't even get a ticket to those. <laughs> so uh, sometimes I'm worried I'm not going to be allowed in. So uh, definitely make sure that you uh, go and join the legendtrips.com mailing list so that you can find out about these events when they happen. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back on the other side, we'll be joined by tonight's guest, Eric Walter. He's the director of My Amityville Horror. It is featuring Daniel Lutz. It is Daniel Lutz's story about his experiences with the Amityville house and in the years ensuing. You can check out the website for that, amityvillemovie.com. And the film is actually available. You can get it uh, through video on demand. You can get it through the online uh, video services. Uh, and you can also get it from, you know, your regular Comcast and, and Verizon on demand. I've seen it on my, on Verizon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's a unique perspective. And we'll talk about Eric about that and a whole lot more coming up in just a little bit here on Spooky South Coast. Golf Cart is here. This is your chance to play six of the South Coast's favorite courses in 2013. This $450 value is on sale starting April 8th at WBSM.com for just $199. You'll have access to courses like the Country Club of New Bedford, a private club of great tradition founded in 1902. The 18-hole championship golf course has a variety of memberships available and was designed by two of the most renowned golf architects, Donald Ross and Willie Park Jr. The club, its membership, and employees have maintained a practice of hospitality, fellowship, and fair play. Another exciting feature to this golf pass is the Hawthorne Country Club, a beautiful picturesque golf course overlooking the Pascomancic Valley. The 5,655-yard course comes with a complete facility including clubhouse, dining room and lounge, golf shop, bag room, lockers, and showers. Play these fabulous courses, plus the Back Nine Club, Little Harbor, Allendale Country Club, and Bay Point with your 2013 VIP golf pass. Buy it starting April 8th on WBSM.com. I need to lose 10 pounds, but I just don't have time to exercise. With Live Skinny, losing the weight is as simple as drinking from a water bottle. And today, you can get Live Skinny for free. I just drink water? Yes, it's literally weight loss support in a water bottle. Want proof? The active ingredients at Live Skinny featured on Dr. Oz showed how Live Skinny boosts your body's own natural metabolism and burns away the fat. All you have to do is drink. With clinically proven ingredients, Live Skinny's raspberry ketone, green coffee bean, African mango extract, and Garcinia Cambogia are guaranteed to help you lose weight. Wait, and right now it's free. How do I get it for free? Free trials of Live Skinny are available right now at LiveSkinny.com. Get rid of those nagging 10 to 20 pounds. Women reported losing up to 11 pounds in the first week. In fact, a 10-week study shows participants lost an average of 28 pounds and over 18% of their body fat. So get your free Live Skinny trial today at LiveSkinny.com. But hurry, this free trial offer is only available to the first 100 people 18 years or older. So lose the weight and Live Skinny at LiveSkinny.com.
my dreams my entire life. I could not separate reality from from what was going on. The, the, the It's been similar to something that has been in my dreams my entire life. I could not separate reality from from what was going on. There, there came a point where it was like this family nightmare come true, uh, and and I could not just. It, it was almost like being awake in your own dream. But that scene to me has been. Uh, a, a, a reoccurring dream probably 500 times in my life um, and again it's never about all right welcome back to spooky south coast there we go the amityville curse is happening again on us that was from the teaser trailer uh for the film my amityville horror which you can check out on the website amityvillemovie.com and uh, of course i try to play it and it doesn't buffer fast enough and just one of the many problems that we have talking about Amityville. Hopefully we can get through the rest of the night without any issues because we're joined by our guest, Eric Walter. He's a writer, director, and documentarian specializing in the exploration of the unexplained. As a Maryland native, Eric began writing and producing original short subject films at a very early age, refining his artistic skills in nearly every medium he could lay his hands on. In 2008, Eric moved to Los Angeles to pursue his career in the film industry, his continued research into infamous unsolved mysteries started his desire to pursue documentary filmmaking. He has consulted on numerous investigative projects for both television and radio, and is currently developing his next feature film project for 2013. My Amityville Horror is his first feature, and he is joining us on the line right now to discuss it. Good evening, Eric. How are you doing? How's it going? Nice to meet you with you. Oh, it's great to have you, and uh, we have to apologize in advance for any technical issues, because as I referenced there, whenever we talk about Amityville, all hell breaks loose in our show. <laughs> I understand. I have a couple of those uh, experiences myself, so I'll be interested to chat and see what yours are. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask you. You know, Did you have technical issues in the making of the film that seemed kind of unusual and out of the ordinary? Well, I, I don't know about technical issues, but it's just been you know one... Uh, issue to another, just trying to get the film done in, in general. Um, this has been a very difficult uh, process, obviously, working with the original participants. Um, not many people want to talk about this anymore, mm -hmm. especially the original people that were involved in it, uh, the Lutz family. Uh, the, you know, our, my producing team and myself, we tried very hard to incorporate a lot of the different experiences of people that uh, many people either passed away or don't want to speak about it anymore, so this was kind of a first-person perspective on Daniel Lutz, who was 10 years old at the time uh, when these occurrences allegedly happened, haunting occurrences. Um, and he also was the oldest of the Lutz children at the time, so probably, I don't know, he's in the position of remembering the most detail of his experience inside the house. And, and he might have been privy to a little bit more information than, than uh, Melissa and Christopher might have been, too. Correct. So I, I thought I read somewhere that you've actually had a long fascination with the Amityville case yourself. That's true, and I, you know, ever since I've been a very young kid, you know, I've been uh, just totally enamored with the story. I read the book as a kid, uh, the book The Amityville Horror by Jay Anson, and, you know, I was overtaken by the story and interested to the point that, you know, I began investigating it myself. I, you know, went to Amityville. I grew up in Maryland, like you mentioned, and so I drove up to Amityville and went to the Historical Society. I, you know, I looked into records. I talked with people there. I went to the house, of course, and took photographs and this type of thing. I, you know, made friends with people online and began to accumulate documents, uh, you know, trial transcripts and things like this, um, and just kind of developing, you know, opinion about the story. And it took many years. I mean, many people, outsiders, want to say this was either a hoax or was, you know, all of it was true. And, you know, I always said that I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle of all that. And, uh... And in many ways, the truth is unattainable in this case. You know, it's been lost in so much misinformation about the story. Uh, it's difficult to actually get, you know, within the myth that surrounds all of it. So uh, in 2007, I established a website with a friend of mine called AmityvilleFiles.com that basically was uh, a treasure trove of everything Amityville. Um, newspaper archive, uh, kind of a create, creative in, you know, presentation of the story and the place that people could go and kind of look into the 
record and develop an, you know, their own opinion about what happened there from an unbiased perspective. Because so many of these other websites were kind of trying to disprove the story or, you know, anything you would find online if you never could find something that, you know, look at and say, I want to make up my own mind about this and find out all the information. And I still don't think all of the information is up there, but, you know, there, there is quite a bit. <laughs> so it was kind of a place, you know, it's been an ongoing project uh, for me just personally. And, and you're right about how it is hard to sometimes separate the, the mythology of Amityville from the fact, because so much of what we've seen through the various media has influenced what we think is the true story. So uh, a lot of people will assume that because it was in Anson's book or because it was in, you know, any one of the Amityville films that at some point the Lutzes must have said it. So uh, we're allowing other people to put words into their mouths. Right. And what I've never understood, honestly, is, is why George and Kathy Lutz allowed Jay Anson uh, so much creative license in the, with the original book. Uh, because, of course, he took a lot of creative license and in, in things that were inserted in the book um, and used, you know, George and Kathy's real names, the children's real names, and, I, you know, honestly, that was probably the worst thing that ever could have happened to the family, that that book was put out the way that it was with, you know, a true story stamped on the front cover. Um, so in many ways, you know, it's been attributed to, you know, the action they took following that, leaving the house at the time. So I think that's probably the, the you know, unfortunate part about this, because it's now snowballed into something that it really never was. I mean, that actually is what fascinates me and was the main source of inspiration for one of the threads within Miamiville horror. And you're right, they could have taken that, you know, that, that uh, William Peter Blatty approach of giving them a fictionalized name, uh, you know, taking the true story and instead of having a true story on the cover, having based on a true story on the cover and giving them uh, fictional names to kind of protect their identity. Uh, but right. I, I guess from what I understand, and, and you probably would know this better than I, but their hand was kind of already forced uh, because William Weber was already uh, the attorney for right. for Ronald DeFeo was already working on a book that would have outed the Lutz family anyway. So this was kind of their own uh, almost preemptive or or counterstrike to what Weber was doing. Right, but if if you know, it's always been my question, I guess, if that was the case, then why did they allow so much creative license to be taken with the book? Uh, right. Because you know they were copyright holders on the book, uh, George and Kathy, that is, and you know it's just kind of an I, I guess they didn't have any. Uh, creative control over that end of it, or how Jay Anson was going to portray it. But, um, yeah, that's always been one of the unfortunate things about it, but of course, you know, the movie straight far and wide from that, of course, the re by the time the remake came around in 2005, you know, we were far, far removed from anything based on truth. And um, So that was kind of the inspiration for me, was to, again, present an unbiased perspective, somewhere people could go and find out all the information if they wanted to, and develop an, a well-balanced opinion. It took years for me, and it, and it started kind of, you know, developed into an obsession for me, and something that's kind of followed me. And so, in many ways, that you know, as much as I've, this, you know, sought out this project, the documentary Miami Horror, it's also kind of found me. What was interesting was, in 2009, I was contacted by a friend of Daniel Watts, who was a contractor in the Queens area of New York, and said that Daniel was wanting to go public, but wanted to speak to somebody who was kind of educated on the story and didn't want to have to explain or educate somebody, you know, on all the facts, this type of thing. And, of course, mm -hmm. at first, I thought this was a scam, or, you know, why, if, if this is him, why is he wanting to go public now? Is this some kind of money-seeking venture, or is this something that he uh, was a seeking, you know, attention or something like this? And so, I, of course saw a picture of my, you know, I demanded, I asked the gentleman, you know, could you send me a picture, and you know, I'd like to see him, and I couldn't deny when he did so uh, the striking resemblance he had to Kathy Lutz, his mom. Right. And so I knew, I knew then that we were dealing most likely with the right person, and I began speaking with, with Danny over the phone, and as anyone who's seen the film will, you know, will know right off the bat that he's an extremely intense uh, personality, oh, and definitely, it was hard yeah. to hard to get a sense of his character over the phone, so I flew to New York in August of 2009 with a, you know, just a digital recorder and a, a set of black and white photographs, the investigation photographs that uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren had taken on, uh, uh, they had hired a photographer on March 6, 1976, during the investigation of 112 Ocean Avenue. And I brought these photographs along with me, and upon meeting Daniel, I 
lay these out in front of them, and we began having discussions. And you could feel, you know, the years coming off of his chest as he started to talk about this. So many of the pictures there he hadn't even seen. Um, one of which is the infamous Ghost Boy photograph, which he had a lot to say about. You know, he, of course, he thinks that it, you know, definitely was something of a supernatural nature. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of conjecture about that over the years, but we'll get into that anyway. So it was that was an initiation process for me into his character and learning who I was dealing with here, and it was not an easy process. <laughs> That's definitely for sure. It, it seemed like even though he was willing to to open the door, so to speak, there were a lot of rooms that remained locked. That's very, very accurate. Um, and actually quite infuriating for me as, as a filmmaker. Not only did many of the, like, namely Christopher and a lot of the other people in the family did not want to speak um, because of Daniel's involvement, mm-hmm. but um, Danny was, you know, refusing to go in certain areas of his life, uh, admittedly, and that was a difficult thing. Of course, you can't force someone to speak but a lot of things, you know, like the time in his life when he disappears, he says, uh, he's sitting with Lorraine, and she, she asks him, you know, where did you go after running away from home, which is what he said he, he claims he did. And, of course, by all accounts, I've talked to some members of the family, and, and that's, you know, been corroborated. And, that you know, Danny kind of disappeared from the family at, at 15. And um, he discussed it, you know, he disappeared into the desert and just kind of wouldn't talk about that end of his life. But you get the sense that there definitely was something... Uh, you know, up <laughs> there with him. And so I, it was kind of an interesting uh, left to the imagination. It, so much of the film is that way. I, I understand, you know, what it must have been like for you as a filmmaker, because as a viewer, as you're watching it, you know, you're hearing these stories, and some of them seem kind of fantastical that, you know, here's a family that was pretty much, you know, even still in the public eye in the early 80s, because there were still pumping out Amityville movies sure. and they were, and John Jones was writing those books that were, I don't know, right. 95, 98% fiction, but you know, they still had the Lutz name in them. So they're still under a microscope and, and it, it, it just didn't seem plausible to me that, Oh yeah, you're just going to let your son take off and, and you're just going to sure. allow this kind of stuff to happen. But if, if you've cooperated with the family, then I guess then it had to be true. Well, in the end of that, there was a small twist relationship between Daniel and his stepfather, George, mm-hmm. that, that definitely was corroborated, and, and I think, uh, you know, can't be denied. Um, and so much of Daniel's story and account is interlaced with not only the paranormal events he claims happened, but with his relationship with George. Um, and myself, my own opinion, and a lot of people have been asking, you know, what, what does the filmmaker think? Because, you know, I really wanted to leave the film open to an objective nature, just as I did with the site, in the sense that, because there are no answers, and as I mentioned, the, the truth is unattainable in this case. There are only five people in that house, two of which are dead, three of which were, you know, very young children at the time, and then they were only they were the only people to corroborate their events. There was no one else to, there to corroborate them. Right. So, you know, you're in a position now where it is left to myth. It is left to to study the effect that it's had. I mean, Daniel has been, as with his siblings, I'm sure, have been living in the shadow of the Amityville horror for their entire adult lives and have moved on in different ways from it. So this was an opportunity to kind of examine that from a psychological uh, impact perspective. But also, for me, the, the film represents the blurry line between reality and imagination. And for me, that was an interesting uh, perspective, because I'm, I actually am highly skeptical of a lot of the different stories that Daniel does tell. I feel that a lot of his anger... Uh, and his statements about George are colored by his anger mm-hmm. with the person. Um, the need to blame, you know, put blame on someone about the haunting. That's my own opinion um, through working and talking with him. Um, at the same time, you know, he would probably fight me vigorously on that and say that, you know, everything he's saying is true. Um, I'd be interested to hear, you know, someday Christopher's opinion on it. I know he said similar things, you know, about father but right. you know without speaking for either of them you know it's that's just my opinion well when we had we had uh, christopher on the show uh, a couple of years ago and right. when he came on you know he was he was being somewhat evasive because he had his own media projects in the work so he didn't want to share a lot with us but he shared right. a lot with me privately off the air too and uh but one thing he did comment on the program about was that uh you know similar stories to what daniel was telling about george that he had a hand in the occult 
and that, that they feel like that was what caused the problem more than living in the DeFeo murder house. Uh, and also, I, I just look back at it, and I, I have to think that, again, being young children, they were something like, what, 10, 7, and 5 when they lived in the house. And, and their memory of it is going to be tainted by the media portrayal of it. And right. I understand that, you know, they could say, you know, I never watched the movie till I was 20, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you also have to understand that George and Kathy had to stick by their story for all those years, too. So when they go right. to their mother and say, hey, mom, you know, is this really what happened? Naturally, Kathy's going to say yes before she's going to openly admit that she was involved in any kind of fraudulent activity. Not that I'm saying that she was, but I'm just saying she would have a reason to lie. If that right. was the case. So you don't know if you're getting an actual experience or what he thinks he remembers his experience really was. Right. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a difficult process even for me because I've always had the gut feeling. And it, and it is a gut feeling. And, and I, again, it isn't based on any proof. However, I've heard, I know uh, close to, you know, pretty much all of the interviews given by George and Kathy that have been made public just through my own research over the years, even prior to getting involved in this with Daniel. Um, I've always had the opinion that something, something happened to this family of a, of a real paranormal nature. Um, as I mentioned also, I, I believe that it snowballed into something that it never really was and now represents something that it never was um, from the outset. And as you were mentioning, you know, this is, this is now, it represents something completely different uh, for the children. It's, a, it's like the third, uh, pers- you know, third-party perspective, even though he was, Daniel was there, I still question a lot of the, I don't want to say validity would be the right word, but they, they, I question a lot of the stories and, and how uh, lurid detail he goes into. I mean, he, he went into detail about standing in a certain position on a sta- you know, on the stairs at a certain time, the way someone was looking. I mean, you know, not only was this a traumatic event at the time, I believe that, you know, I would certainly remember details of that, but as a 10-year-old, you know, I don't remember details in exacting order like that. You know, so there was kind of a, as anybody who had seen the film, there's a sort of theatricality to his character right. that I feel is filling a lot in, you know, a lot of the gaps in um, on the story and kind of creating that narrative. So for people, you know, I would just say to watch this with an open mind. And it's, you know, as Laura DiDio, who I'm good friends with, and I, I really respect her and, and was very pleased to have her uh, involvement uh, in doing an interview with Daniel on the film, um, she mentioned that you know Amityville is a thread, and this is a this is another installment essentially in what's become its own subgenre. Mm-hmm. And so this documentary isn't I, I feel transcends the topic of Amityville in many ways, and isn't just an Amityville you know film. It it really kind of comments on anyone a witness to paranormal events to the unexplained and, and trying to rationalize and explain that to a public who's already mired in misinformation for decades on this story and it's not the easiest of prospects well we've only got a few minutes here left before we have to take a break for the news uh, but when we come back on the other side i want to talk more with you eric about you know some of the theories uh, of amityville and i want to talk to you about you know the process of digging through this story uh and in, in making this film but uh one thing that i do want to ask but before we come out of here for the first hours that intense emotion that we saw out of daniel lutz and, and the way that he reacted uh to some of your questioning was it like that when the cameras weren't on too yes very much so and, and we'll get into that in detail uh i hope <laughs> so, sounds like yes. some good stories there very, very much so. I will, um, I will say this. After watching that film and, and talking with Christopher, um, I don't know if it's uh, if it's a, a family trait, but they, they, are, they seem to be very intense uh, individuals. Well, they have a reason to be, yeah. I would say. You know? So I, I, I can understand, at least I can understand that. And, you know, I respect Daniel for coming forward and having the guts to do this after so long. Um, but I, I don't he sees the film in the same way that I or others would see the film. He sees it as kind of, you know, vindication in a sort of, a sort of way from what he feels the stepfather triggered on the family. Uh, I see it as someone who's been dramatically, psychologically scarred by something that he cannot explain mm-hmm. and something that happened in his childhood. And um, that is a unique perspective for me to explore. And so everyone will pull something different out of it, which is, I think the best films always resonate with that theme. 
Absolutely. And I, I originally contacted your producer, Andrea, uh, in trying to get an interview with, with Danny for the show. And, and she said that right. he's not doing any media. And after seeing the film, I kind of understand why, because there is no filter with him. And, uh, right. Well, he, he told me that he would do this one time and was not interested in being interviewed thousands of times about this topic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I knew I had one chance to, well, I'll be interested to see if he comes forward and hope that he will, you know, eventually. But uh, I think that he's, you know, he's going through a time of trying to remove himself from it, too. Well, well even though it's an extremely difficult process. Having you on to discuss the film saved us a lot in FCC fines. <laughs> True. <laughs> All right, and, and uh, we have about a minute here before we take a break, but where can people find the film? I mentioned that, you know, it's available on demand uh, with the cable companies, but where else can they can they pick up the film? Right, it's playing in select theaters around the country right now. You can go to AmityvilleMovie.com slash screening to find out that information. Also, um, you can find it on iTunes, Amazon Instant Download, uh, Xbox, PS3, you name it. It's, you know, Comcast, Time Warner. It's, it's up there, cable VOD. It's pretty much all over the place. Excellent. So all the information is on our website. And it's all linked up right on the front page of our website, SpookySouthCoast.com. We're going to take a break for the news. When we come back, we will talk more with our guest, Eric Walter, about the film, My Amityville Horror. Uh, check out the website for that, AmityvilleMovie.com. And we'll talk more about Daniel Lutz, his experiences, and, and the process of making this film and trying to get this uh, information out of Daniel uh, with such a traumatic uh, experience in his life and, and trying to share that in a way that, you know, you can't help but listen with a with a skeptical ear to some of the things that they say, but at the same time, you see the look on his face, and it just seems like, you know, he's so scarred from this. So uh, check out the film for sure. We'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast. The station the South Coast turns to for local news, talk, weather, and sports. WBSM New Bedford, AM 1420, WBSM. From ABC News. I'm Daniela Bellotta. One man is still missing after an avalanche struck on Granite Mountain an hour east of Seattle. The search has now been called off for the night. ABC's Trisha Manning-Smith is there. One survivor has a shoulder injury, the other her hamstring. The search continues for the third member of that party. The King County Sheriff's Office says all three men are from the Kent Auburn area. They were apparently, among others, no shoers of a different party, though, in that Granite Mountain area when the avalanche hit, and those others are now helping in the search. One one woman is suffering from hypothermia after being unearthed from the snow. A Cape Canaveral, Florida sergeant terminated over Trayvon Martin's shooting targets that he brought to a training exercise. Shortly after the shooting targets were first put out on the web for sale, the person who tried to sell them, took them off the market. There was tremendous backlash against them. It doesn't show Trayvon Martin's face. What it does show is that a faint hoodie that Trayvon Martin wore the night he was shot by a local watchman, George Zimmerman, in a Florida neighborhood. That's ABC's Matt Gutman. A new town mom delivering the president's weekly address. Francine Wheeler's six-year-old son was killed in the Connecticut school massacre. We have to convince the Senate to come together and pass common sense gun responsibility reforms that will make our communities safer and prevent more tragedies like the one we never thought would happen to us. Secretary of State John Kerry and one of North Korea's allies agreeing to work together. In Beijing, Secretary of State John Kerry said there's been enough confrontational language and made this appeal to North Korea on behalf of the U.S. and China. We also joined together in calling on North Korea to refrain from provocations and to abide by international obligations. China, meanwhile, recommitted itself to finding a peaceful solution to the crisis on the Korean Peninsula. Linda Alvin, ABC News. Kerry is now en route to Japan, the last stop on his three-day Asia tour. You're listening to ABC News. Hi, this is Dick Morris. Obamacare is taking full effect this year with over 15,000 pages of regulations. You need to know how this law affects you. That's why you should get your copy of Obamacare's Survival Guide. It's easy to read and the best guide to the new law. Even if you're currently insured or a senior on Medicare or a business owner, a medical profession, or really any citizen, you need the Obamacare Survival Guide. In it, you'll find about hidden taxes, fees, and fines, including a 40% tax on some health plans. I warned you about Obamacare. It's rationing Medicare cuts and will trigger doctor shortages. Now the Obamacare Survival Guide gives you the simple steps to protect your family. So get the Obamacare Survival Guide at bookstores everywhere. It's already a number one Amazon bestseller. Or get our special four ninety five dollars offer and save $15 today by going to Obamacare911.com, Obamacare911.com. 
That's Obamacare911.com. Southern Minnesota restaurant owner is hoping a weapons discount will get his customers to add their voices to the gun debate. ABC Scott Goldberg has more. At the Langtree Cafe in Brownsdale, Minnesota, Thursday is Conceal and Carry Day. So if you come out with a concealed gun, uh, you get 15% off. And cafe owner Steve Nagel says if you wear your weapon out in the open, the discount is even deeper. Well, then it's 25% off your meal. It's totally legal for permit holders under Minnesota law, says Mauer County Sheriff Teresa Mazzi. Although... It's certainly uh, unique for Mauer County. And Steve Nagel says business is know. booming. I, I'm sure there's a possibility that, uh, you know, that that may offend some people. Scott Goldberg, ABC News. To what depths would a submarine commander go to hide his cheating ways? Apparently pretty deep. You could call his strategy, let Bob do it. A Navy investigation found that married sub-commander Michael Ward II sent his mistress in Virginia an email from a fictitious person named Bob in July, posing as a co-worker, saying Ward had died unexpectedly. Ward was relieved of command of the USS Pittsburgh, and not long after he apologized Friday, a panel of officers decided that Ward should be honorably discharged, not expelled. But the Navy secretary will have the final word on that. Chuck Sievertson, ABC News. A lot of golf fans wondering if Tiger Woods intentionally broke the rules by placing his ball in a way that would give him an edge. He got a two-stroke penalty for the drop. This is ABC News. The joint supplements of today are sadly incomplete because they don't give you the joint relief you need. Until now. Introduced in the complimentary two-week sample of Instaflex, our most powerful joint formula ever. It's the number one selling joint supplement at GNC. Claim your sample today. 1-800-451-6580. Great for your knees, hands, even your hips. Instaflex is available at GNC, but you can only get your complimentary two-week sample by calling 1-800-451-6580. 1-800-451-6580. I'm Daniela Bellotta, ABC News. 7,000 high school students drop out every school day. That's one every 26 seconds. So here's a 26-second message of encouragement. Hi, I'm Stacy. Look, you know, I've been there. It's tough. And I just want to say, if you find yourself feeling negative, use it as motivation. Let it be like the fuel in the fire to keep you going. Because the best is yet to come. Seriously, you're capable of great things, things you probably haven't even dreamed of yet. So don't quit now. See you at graduation. Do you have 26 seconds to convince a student to stay at their desk? Now you can share your message of support at boostup.org. We can keep students in school. Visit boostup.org and take the first step. Brought to you by the U.S. Army and the Ad Council. Everyone hates a smelly litter pan. But new Cat's Pride Fresh and Light absorbs odor-causing enzymes. And that's something... Welcome to Health Talk, a program on health, medicine, and nutrition, featuring the latest... If you AM 1420, WBSM presents Spooky South Coast with your hosts, Tim Weisberg and Matt Costa. Welcome back, hour number two of Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa. Again, science advisor Matt Moniz is out at a MUFON meeting. Probably now a MUFON party. Yep. And uh, hopefully they're thinking of us. I know that he's uh, hanging out with uh, the Starborn twins, who were recently featured on that new show on the Bio channel about alien uh, abductions. Oh, yeah, I saw that on, uh, I think I, on Facebook or whatever. But you didn't see the show? No, not yet. It, it premiered last week while we were at the Houghton Mansion, so I haven't had a chance yeah. to see it yet, but... Check it out. I've heard good things. 
But we are talking tonight about Amityville, hence all the technical issues that we're having. Uh, I noticed that people in the chat room on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com have been having their internet crash, their Wi-Fi crash, you know, losing the video feed. That's what happens. And that's why I keep just typing in the chat room whenever anybody says anything. I just type Amityville. <laughs> because that's there's really no other way to explain it. That's what happens on the show when we talk about it. Uh, we either have technical issues or we incur FCC fines, as we did with Jackie Barrett. And uh, we have our guest joining us tonight, Eric Walter. He is the director of the film My Amityville Horror, which uh, tells Daniel Lutz's story uh, about what went on in those 28 days at 112 Ocean Avenue. And uh, Eric, in the film, you you actually have uh, Daniel standing outside of the house. Uh, was that the first time that he'd been back there since it since it happened? No, I don't believe so. I believe he had been back uh, several times before. Yeah, he actually lives in New York, as I mentioned. Uh, in the Queens area of New York. Uh, the rest of the family lives in another state, and he's kind of, uh, you know, separated from, from everyone else. So I know he's been back several times. And he never really actually showed any fear of going back to the house, which was pretty interesting. Uh, Laura DiDio, I know, made many comments about that. You know, he really showed no fear at all, except of actually discussing going back to that place in his mind, in his memories about it and trying to rationalize it. That was where he began to lock up and become very, very tense and argumentative with, with everyone, with my crew, anyone who was on camera. So it was a very, very selective you know, process of trying to expose him to certain parts, you know, certain interviewers, certain people, to try to extract these memories. And it wasn't something you could just kind of get all done in, in one shot. You know? So it was a, you know, as most documentaries are, it takes a very, very long time. And, and this film uh, took a little over four years to produce Wow. From the process of me befriending Danny to kind of gaining his trust to, uh, you know, shooting the interviews and doing the post-production all myself. And it's kind of, it's been, uh, you know, a passion project, but it's also been something that's you know, haunted me uh, as well. Well, I mean, that must have been, though, the, the hardest part of the entire process is, is convincing Danny that you weren't just another one of these people that are out there looking to make a buck off the Amityville saga. Right. Well, I mean, documentary in of itself is not uh, <laughs> a, a lucrative, uh, uh, you know, industry to get into if you're looking to make you know, big money or something. You know, right. It's not a fictionalized account or, you know, another Amityville horror sequel. Uh, you know, we were really trying to tell the truth, and that was Danny's truth of what actually happened in the house. And so, again, as I mentioned, this was a psychological portrait of, of someone who had been, you know, scarred by these events. And so, if, you know, from my perspective examining that uh, effect was the main prerogative and I think we were very successful in doing that. Of course, I look back on it now and I wish you know, that I had, I had gotten uh, Christopher and, and various other people to speak in the film. I actually had spoken to Christopher many times prior to uh, shooting the film, you know, actually rolling cameras at all and uh, uh, was going to work with him, but uh, I think, you know, he got, you know, yeah, he wanted to produce his own projects and so I guess, you know, We'll have to wait to see what he has to say about it coming up. And were you, were you able to make contact with Melissa? Uh, she wants no part of anything Amityville. So it's really, you know, I, I try not to talk uh, for any of the other family members right. that I've really been able to interact with. But, um, yeah, she, from what I understand, you know, Christopher seems the other, you know, the only person who's really kind of come out and, and talked publicly other than Danny now. But, um, now that George and Kathy are passed away, you know, we're losing many of the actual key witnesses who were there at the time. And the kids were so young, you know, it's a, you have to look at it in a different, in a different light. And for me, this is like the Amityville horror through the eyes of a 10-year-old, essentially. Even though, yes, he is now a 47-year-old man, but, you know, well, how has the truth, you know, been twisted and morphed in that, you know, large period of time in his own mind, in his own memory? And he actually said to me, you know, um, I, you know, don't remember things in, you know, sequential order from like day one to 28. I remember it, you know, in severity order, which mm. was interesting. And, and that's kind of how the film introduces itself, too. Um, in many ways, it's kind of an insiderish, you know, film. Uh, it's, it's for people, you know, if, if you have a little bit of knowledge about the case, that's probably a good thing. <laughs> um but also, you know, if you people that don't know anything about Amityville, I think, you know, it definitely can pull, uh, obviously, see the psychological effect, but also pull 
many of the experiences that he talked about, which were you know quite extreme uh, from Daniel's point of view, anyway. And, and you know, the, the the title is Miami to Horror, and when you're watching it, you know, you expect it to be uh, the Amityville Horror story through Daniel's eyes, and it is that. But at the same time, it's also uh, very much the horror of what his life was like at the time, before it, and even after it. And we've all heard the story, and we've all seen the films, and and George is always portrayed as almost like the, the protective father figure who you know, is trying to provide for his new family in the best way that he can and wants to take care of them. And then all of these forces are coming against them. And, you know, they all rally around George and George is kind of uh, falls victim to this just as much as anybody else. And I think that he's been kind of romanticized and we, we've lost the true story of, of who George Lutz was. And it, and it seems like to the kids, and I know that there's plenty of people in the paranormal world who made friends with George Lutz in his later years and will stand by his character and, and will say that he was a, a great individual, but it seems like to these kids, you know, part of the horror was having to deal with George. Right, and, and what the story became, you know, and continues was perpetrated in years afterwards. Um, you know, I didn't know George Lutz personally, so I can't speak to George's character personally. Um, however, all of the people that I spoke with, uh, you know, excluding you know, not only Daniel and Christopher, but also uh, Lorraine Warren, uh, Laura DiDio, uh, people, you know, investigators that had talked to George at the time, everyone seemed to have some sort of, uh, I don't want to say negative, but some kind of, you know, uh, interesting uh, relationship with him in the way that there was some kind, you know, he was very wound up at the time. Um, and I would be too, of course, if I'm, you know, I'm leaving my house and, and everything that's in it and moving clear across the country. And, and uh, you know, you know, it definitely, obviously, it was in the public eye at the time, and so that was that was difficult. But obviously, from the children's perspective, you know, there there definitely was a tumultuous relationship there with with Daniel in particular. Um, but you have to, you know, let's face it, you know, the natural father was taken out of their life at a very young age and replaced with. Uh, an ex-marine, someone who was kind of domineering by all accounts over the over the kids. Mm. But also, Danny will be the first to admit you that he provoked a lot of this. Um, you know, he didn't like this person being in his life. Uh, he was instigating a lot of the fights that went on with George, um, breaking his stuff. You know, just kind of provoking you know fights and this type of thing. And so you have to wonder, you know, is some of it kind of uh, it's all instigated, you know, in his in that, in that way. But I know that for sure that it, it appears that the two boys see George completely differently, and they were there. None of us were there, right? And so we have to. I was going to say it, it. It was similar with Christopher when we had him on. I mean, he did talk about the, you know, the domineering aspect of of having George Lutz as a stepfather, but he did share stories, you know, about when George first started coming around and was trying to make an impression on the boys. Of, of trying to be, you know, the cool guy on his Harley strike and popping wheelies and, yeah. you know, uh, trying, yeah, trying to be that type of figure. Same, same stuff to me, yeah. And, and it just seems like, you know, once... Um, they, they both say that there was a little bit of that aspect of George before they moved into Ocean Avenue, you know, a little bit of that, that, that domination, but that it became far worse in the house. And, and I, I think that, you know, Lorraine Warren makes a great point about it in the film, you know, how much of that is somebody's character and how much of that is the effect of what was going on. Sure. And and obviously this person comes into your life and then, you know, not even a year later we move into this house, all of this happens, we move clear across the country. You know, to a child, you're going to start to blame somebody for this. You know, well, as soon as this person showed up in my life, all of this started to happen. That may be, you know, that's a theory of mine, you know, that has to have some kind of uh, effect, at least in the personal relationship that, you know, between Danny and George. Um, but what's interesting to me is how somehow now the memory of the paranormal phenomena has been interlaced with the memory of George Lutz and what George Lutz represented, because in many ways, for Danny at least, George Lutz re represented the Amityville horror for Danny. Mm -hmm. And there was no, I mean, of course, being a documentarian, you can't try to say you, you may be wrong on this. You may be remembering this wrong. You know, of course, my job, um, I conducted, for anyone who's seen the film, 
uh, we shot the film from a first-person perspective during the interview, which was having Daniel look into the camera. Because during my first interviews with him, I was sitting across the table, and he was, you know, chain-smoking cigarettes just as he is in the film, and, you know, he's a pretty rough guy. And he's sitting there, and he's going through these investigation photographs, and he's just going on and on. I mean, for, for I recorded over 12 hours of audio uh, when the first time I showed up there, and wow. had incredible access uh, just to open discussion with him, which was very intense. And a lot of those original audio recordings that are throughout the film in various places were our original discussions. So it was kind of an organic way of, in post-production, you know, initiating the audience to his story with what I was initiated with, which was interesting. But having him look into the camera in that way was a way to uh, have, you know, that was the most chilling aspect. You could see how much of an emotional effect it had on him. In his eyes, you know, he's clearly, you know, sweating during the interview. You know, it was extremely uncomfortable about the entire topic. Um, and he termed it, which the film opens with, which was, I found very interesting, as an unfortunate gift in his life, which is pretty, uh, and kind of a statement that says something about the entire case overall, what it represents for him, which I found interesting. And I, I thought it was uh, very uh, admirable as, as a filmmaker and what you did in not only allowing Danny to tell his story uh, and to tell it freely, but at the same time, you also did bring in different voices and different perspectives to what he had endured. And I, I can't remember the name of, of the gentleman, uh, but there was one person there who uh, was part of the, the film who suggested that maybe there was some degree of paranormal phenomena that took place uh, but not nearly at the level at which, you know, we are led to believe that it did. Right. It was parapsychologist uh, Peter Jordan. Uh, right. He, was, he, he actually is real selective with a lot of the, you know, he, he said he was pretty selective with some of the programs that he had appeared in, and especially about Amityville. He didn't want to talk about it. And actually then involved in debunking the case, you know, when, when Jay Anson's book came out in 77, um, and wrote, you know, uh, and uh, co-authored an article for Fate magazine uh, at the time. And, you know, they had investigated the claims that were in uh, uh, the book, Jansen's book, The Amityville Horror. And that's always been kind of my problem with, I guess, the debunking aspect from it is that people are trying to pull from the source that, you know, that obviously is a fictional account mm -hmm. by, by the people uh, that were involved in it. Have you even said that, too? So it's kind of been lost, as we, as we talked about, lost in the myth uh, that's been built up around it from the very outset, um, which is pretty interesting now to see, you know, actual participants. You know, here we have Daniel Lutz, and when I first went there to New York to interview him, you know, I was hoping to, you know, think I'm going to get, you know, this entire perspective, you know, from beginning to end on everything, but obviously, um, not only, I, I, I got much more than that, but it was, it was, you know, so very difficult to put together a timeline in the sense that he didn't remember things from day one to twenty eight, like I mentioned. Um, so that was a that was a great challenge, and and obviously interlacing that with various perspectives of people who were there: Peter Jordan, Joel Martin, Laura Vidia, who I mentioned before, you know, was very very key. Uh, she still had a lot of her original notes and investigation, uh, you know, notebooks and things from the story at the time. She actually was you know majorly instrumental and bringing together a lot of the people who became attached to the story after Lutz has fled the house, like Ed Lorraine Warren and Dr. Hans Holzer and, you know, a various degree of other people who, you know, became involved in the story, and, and she, you know, spoke to Bill Weber extensively as well. Um, so she kind of had a, you know, I, I think she has definitely the most objective viewpoint on the story from the people, and she was actually there. So I wanted to involve, you know, her to be the person to interview Danny Lutz, which I thought worked out, you know, immensely well. Right. I, I greatly respect her opinion. And I think, yeah, she did a fantastic job uh, as an interviewer. And it's just kind of, because, um, I mean, let's face it, and you, you experience this in making the film. Uh, sometimes Lorraine Warren is a little, you know, hard to keep on topic sometimes. And uh, and I thought she did a great job of, of uh, kind of keeping things from getting a little, because there is that one very tense moment in the film uh, when Lorraine's about to bring out the relics, and right. and that right. definitely for for the viewer, you know, you you can tell if 
if, if that kind of encapsulates some of the the tension that there might have been in, in the filming and in, in getting Danny to open up about a lot of this stuff, I think that kind of portrays it perfectly. Uh, right, and I was so pleased that that actually happened. That you know the fourth wall was kind of broken there mm-hmm. in the sense that he had Danny addressed the, the film crew, and that was actually me who he was addressing. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, and was calling out, you know. Uh, you know, who, who, is there anybody here that does not believe in God? And, you know, of course, I had a previous conversation with Danny when I first arrived there, because, uh, you know, he'd asked me what my religion was, and, and I would term myself as an agnostic. You know, I'm, I'm more spiritual, but I don't, I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't practice any reli- uh, organized religion mm-hmm. myself. Um, and Danny's Roman Catholic, which I totally respect, and, and you know, everybody to their own, but I, uh, he definitely, uh, I think, took a step back at that time, you know, thinking that, you know, I was saying that, uh, you know, that I did not believe in God, which I was not saying, you know, so it was kind of an interesting outlook, so it was interesting that that kind of came back up in the process of making the film. Uh, it was kind of an opportunity to kind of call me out, <laughs> essentially, in, in front of the crew, and it was a very tense and awkward moment, you know, of course, we were doing an interview, and then suddenly, it, 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 you know, people are being called out, you know, from behind camera, and it's actually quite humorous too, with you know, the roosters and, and everything going on. <laughs> Those are the things that you hope you hope happen as a documentarian. Of course, there's no script, so you're basically you know you're conducting from real life. And uh, yeah, we just you know we went into her home, and you know she I had already known about uh, that she had uh, roosters inside the house. And, you know, I'd seen that in various other articles and things online, and, and had spoken to her actually at a seminar uh, years before. Um, but yeah, she's a lovely person, Lorraine, and, and I uh, admire her very much. And, and she's definitely, um, you know, I've, I've never questioned the genuineness of, of what she believes in what she's saying. Uh, she's, she's one of the most, it, it's amazing how grounded she is for somebody who talks about things that are so fantastical. Right. No, it, ab- Absolutely. And, and of course, I, I don't want to give too much away f- uh, for people that see the film, but that, that's not the only time that, that Danny calls you out during the film either. Uh, there's that scene at the end. <laughs> well, uh, I thought he was going to jump he, over the table. Well, he kind of did after the camera turned <laughs> off. But uh, that was uh, basically, basically that's, you know, I wanted to end the film on the note of the perfect note, which is was this a hoax or was this a true horror? And it will always be on that note because it will never be answered unless someone creates a time machine and we can all back go back and see what happened. Mm-hmm. There's really no, there's no. It's always going to be left in that question because no matter how much someone can show how you know uh, traumatized they were and cry on camera and all these things that ha- you know it has happened over the years with the various assistants, you know, it's no one's. People are still going to think you know this was a fraud or or you know was all truth, but there's no true evidence. Um, you know, I just asked him, would you be willing to take a polygraph test? Uh, because, you know, his parents, George and Kathy, actually took polygraphs in 1970, 1979 um, during the release of the Amityville Horror, the original uh, film. And they passed, they both passed with flying, you know, flying colors. And so, you know, I prefaced that question with that statement. And you saw how he reacted in the film. Anybody that sees it, you know, he gets very tense. He does say, yes, I would, but he he took it as kind of an assault on his credibility. Well, and he said, yes, I would, but he really hedged on answering the question for, for quite a sure. few minutes before he really did give him an answer. Yeah. And I think, again, it, it was more of an emotional reaction as to, I sat here for eight hours and, and gave this interview, and now you're going to question my, the validity of my, my story? You know, and so that was kind of the reaction uh, from someone who was there, I can tell you that that was more of what that was about. Okay. But I thought that it was an interesting uh, way to end the film because, you know, he stopped the tape and, you know, he got up and we did have words in the parking lot afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't yelling at him or anything, but it was more of just, you know, extremely intense discussion about, you know, thought I was trying to, you know, call him out on the spot. But I'm not sure why he, he took it uh as I, as I said, I think he took it as an assault on his credibility, but I, to this day, I don't know why uh, he got so intense about that. It could also be that you're probably the you know 400th person to ask him that question over the years, too. Sure, and he even, he even said that in the film, too. 
Well, getting back to, to Peter Jordan and his his thoughts about what might have actually gone on in the house and about being about it being a less severe haunting that kind of got blown out of proportion. One of the things that I've wondered now that I've heard Danny's story and now that I've heard Chris's story and I get more of a sense of what it was like in that Lutz home. Uh, I'm starting to wonder if maybe this isn't, and I don't know how much you've researched this aspect of paranormal phenomena, but this seems like it has the setup of being a classic poltergeist case uh, right. in the sense of a poltergeist being something that happens around oh, an agent. That, psychokinesis. Right. Exactly. And could it have been, you know, that, that uh, Danny or Chris or even Melissa, even though she was only, you know, five years old, could it have been them butting heads with George is what caused a lot of this activity to manifest? Could that family dynamic have been what caused the haunting? And hence, that's why no one else who's lived in that house has reported phenomena. I mean, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's an interesting theory. I mean, I've thought about it myself, actually, you know, thinking that a lot of the family dynamics had a lot to do with what happened. I mean, even Danny says it himself in the film that the more... Um, the more anger in the house, the more amplified the paranormal events became. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an interesting statement because, you know, was this, was this bent or hinged on the emotions that were running through the family at the time? And one can only question. I mean, it, like I said, it would be great to be able to go back and look for ourselves, but um, it's all left to this conjecture that's been left behind now. Um, but that is, that is a fascinating theory. And, something and it, that I've actually thought of myself, yeah. And it could be something that they, you know, they would have been completely unaware of uh, that it was happening and that it was their own doing that would have caused it to happen. But it's interesting that uh, you know Dan tells that story in the film about uh, encountering George in his garage and the uh, his own practice of the occult, which Chris also alluded to on our show uh, when he was here with us uh, about the fact that prior to moving to that house. Uh, you know, th they both had knowledge that, that George was involved in, you know, at least the occult. I mean, I know that they admitted to transcendental meditation, well, but it seems to have been something Right, well, I mean, you know, TM isn't, isn't, certainly isn't an occult. I, I've always yeah. wondered that, you know, I, I, I believe, at least from my what I've been told by Danny, is that uh, Kathy began practicing TM with George, you know, after meeting George and, and subsequently marrying him. And I have to wonder, you know, if, you know, someone's, you know, on the floor in a meditative state or something like, you know, like this, um, as people practice, you know, back in the 70s, this type of thing, you know, if, if from a child's perspective, they would think that this is some sort of occult-like thing going on. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that's just a theory. But also, um, you know, there's quite a difference. In, I, I don't know. I've heard various statements on, on, on shows and things from Christopher about what George was involved in, but it's, it's quite a different statement to, to suddenly take it out of um, the realm of just chanting and this type of thing that, that Christopher has claimed, and, and as Danny, you know, alleges that George was able to practice telekinesis and, and move objects with his mind, um, I have to admit, totally blew me out of the water and, and still kind of does to this day. I, I, I have a very difficult time with that story, but obviously as a documentarian you have to present you know, the account of what you're hearing. And it's something that really, uh, I think, makes or breaks people that are watching the film when that's, when that's kind of said. Because, you know, he goes through a lot of the different events that we've heard, um, witnessing apparitions, um, you know, stories of a levitation, this type of thing. But to take it out of the realm of, of spirits and put it into the realm of mind over matter, you know, is, is definitely a, a, a stretch um, certainly, I guess, you know, not if any of this phenomena could happen, I suppose that definitely could happen too, but I found it uh, incredibly hard to swallow myself. And, and also there's, uh, it's almost like when he's bringing that up, it's almost uh, to make George, as you mentioned earlier in the show, you know, to, to place the blame on him. And, and right. you know, and to put him as the as the cause of all this phenomenon, and I think that if it if it happened relatively close to the way that it's been portrayed over the years, uh, I think mm -hmm. that, that would go beyond, uh, you know, anything George could have done. But well, you know, who knows if it opened a door to something else? Sure, sure. And in this film, I think I think many pe you know people have to remember that you know you have to watch it with an open mind, but also it's it's kind of a, a gray area of the story in the sense that you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit and, and think about a lot of things he's saying. And, and it does require, I think, at least in my opinion, multiple viewings because it is one of those films that, you know, a lot of things that are talked about um, can't 
can't or shouldn't be taken so literally. Um, mm-hmm. At this point, you know, there's no way to prove what he, he's saying other than I hope, uh, I mean, certainly Christopher could come forward and either disprove or, or, uh, or can, you know, uh, approve of what he's saying, but it's, it's one of those things that we all have to wait and see. Like I said, Amityville's kind of a thread, so it just, just keeps going on. But, yeah, I, I, it was, it's interesting what George represented for Danny at the time, uh, and, and, and now as kind of being kind of the trigger for the supernatural phenomena that allegedly happened there. We are talking with Eric Walter. He's the director of the film My Amityville Horror, which is uh, out now. If you go to AmityvilleMovie.com, you can find out where there are screenings or how you can get it uh, to watch in your own home. And if you have any questions for Eric, you can give us a call, 508-996-0500, 1-877-996-1420. You can email us, SpookyCrew, at SpookySouthCoast.com. Or send us a question on Twitter, at SpookySC. Uh, and then, of course, there's also the chat room on Spooky TV at SpookySouthCoast.com. And one of the questions from the chat, Eric, is uh, why didn't if, – if, you know, they had a problem with George and with what he was portraying over the years and, and kind of what he stood for. Why didn't any of the children come out while he was still alive and, and call him out on these claims? And from what I understand, at least from Christopher's perspective, he did. When, uh, when the 2005 remake came out, you know, he was speaking to the media – uh, about George then. So uh, did Danny mention, you know, ever wanting to speak publicly about George uh, while he was still with us? No, and, and Danny said that he was running away from this uh, for his entire life and didn't want to have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically his motivation in doing this was to give a story to his children, you know, that they you know, he had never told his children of who he really was um, and who he, you know, what this entire story was about within his life. So that was kind of his, one of his main motivations in, in doing this. But obviously, you know, also exercising a few personal demons as well, I guess you could say. Um, but I have, I have heard, you know, a lot of, about what you mentioned with Christopher and, and uh, he had actually taken, you know, George to court uh, at the time as well. And, you know, there was a lot of different things going on. So I always had to wonder, though, why... You know, if all of this went down and George was, was the culprit in this and it had somehow triggered this on the family, why uh, Kathy sat next to him in, 19, in the 2000 uh, History's Mysteries uh, interview, mm-hmm. uh, two-part uh, documentary that was directed by uh, Dan Farrens uh, at the time. And that was one of the most comprehensive documentaries that was done on the Amityville Horror that, uh, you know, show it brought together a lot of... Uh, participants for the first time in, in, you know, it had been 20 years. So uh, I always wondered why, you know, Kathy would have, you know, she was divorced from him for, you know, I think over 10 years by that point. You know, why was she now sitting next to him if, if he was, you know, there was no more, what would be her motivation in coming back and defending the story with George, you know, after they had been divorced? And that's never really been uh, answered for me. And and did Daniel remain a lot throughout his life, or did he revert back to Quartino like uh, like Christopher did? He still he still carries the Lutz name, which is fascinating, in and of itself. Mm, I, I think there's probably something you know psychological involved with that. Yeah. Yep, I think so too. <laughs> so when you're uh, when you're compiling all this information from him and, and knowing what you know about the case, uh, you know, it, there are also working on this at a time when Amityville is kind of popping up as a as a cottage industry within the the resurgence of the paranormal world. And we've got the Ryan right. Katzenbach films coming out. We've got the Jackie Barrett TV special with Ronnie DeFeo and, and her book that came out. I mean, how much are you paying attention to this other Amityville stories that are, that are out there? You know, it's, it, it's definitely fascinating how much has been said and done and, 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 and uh, debated on this story for so many years. And what's what's I think, you know, some of the, the shame of a lot of what's happened with the story is the, you know, parade of, of third-party witnesses that have come forward in the subsequent years to claim all kinds of, you know, things about this story that, you know, you have to question. Um, of course, Danny and his brother Chris were there. You know, so I, for, for our film, we were really trying to base it on people who were actually there in the house at the time. And so we tried, you know, to remain very objective on an objective basis with the case, and I believe the film reflects that. And so it's interesting to see not only the fiction, but the other pieces that are coming out about this. It's, it's definitely uh, 
uh, an interesting uh, spectacle to behold here. It, it, it is sure. hard. It's hard though to look at the the Amityville story because you, when you've, you're coming at it from two different sides, you've got the DeFeo story and you've got the Lutz story, and although they, you know, they take place within the same walls, uh, they're almost two completely different stories because right. there's there's no guarantee that what happened to Ronnie is the same thing as what happened to George, for example. You know, it, it, we're just speculating that because those murders took place that the house is haunted, or because those murders take place, there's something evil in the house that then plagued the Lutzes. And it, it, it sometimes you have to kind of take them separately and uh, and look at them as separate stories because it, it's almost like I feel this would have happened to the Lutzes had they lived anywhere else too. That's interesting. Um... You know, Danny actually said to me that he believed that if he and his natural father and Kathy and the family had moved into the house, that none of this would have happened. Hmm. So that's the degree of into which he blames George for what happened in the house. You know, I've always found it interesting that if, if, the, true, uh, if the story is true, um, as the Lutzes and Father Ray Pecoraro, who was the, the, the priest that was brought in uh, on moving day to perform a house blessing, if that story is true about him... Uh, doing a house blessing, hearing a voice command him to get out, and feeling a disembodied hand slap him. If that if that is true, as he alleged at the time was, um, you know, certainly George, just by his mere presence of showing up that day, I don't think would have been able to uh, manifest that into being. You know, if if you do believe in hauntings, you know, there seems to be in a whole manner of thing going on in the house. I mean, people who believe in hauntings, obviously, or, or, you know, some people can be more susceptible to hauntings or be able to trigger hauntings into being, and everyone, including Lord Dio, kind of felt that was the case or a possibility, that somehow George's personality triggered a lot of these events into happening. And so it's interesting how that's kind of come out now later. Um, Laura, you know, claimed to me that that was being talked about at the time, you know, back in the 70s, but I, I guess since George was around... You know, it wasn't a main thread of the story, but it's it's fascinating how this is kind of not only taken on a life of its own, the story, but it's now, you know, being, the, the perspective is shifting. You know, now that George has passed away, now that Kathy has passed away, you know, it's the torch is being passed to Daniel and his brother. And so now it's, you know, it's, it's now it's looking at it from a, this perspective of someone who was there, but through a child's eyes. So, you know, I think there's an emotional outlook on that, which is, in a lot of ways, unguarded, and that's a lot of what is in the film in Miami Horror. And and Danny seems to put a lot of uh, stock in the investigations that uh, Ed and Lorraine conducted in that house. And and uh, you know, you said that you showed him the, the Ghost Boy photo, and that was the first time that he'd he'd really encountered that. Uh, I mean, what what is your honest opinion of his reaction to what happened there? Because I know that that photo is a source of great controversy within the paranormal field. Right. Yeah, no, I, I didn't mean to suggest that was the first time he had actually seen the, the Ghost Boy photograph. There were a number of photographs that he hadn't seen of the house and his things, but he had stated that he believed that that photo, um, you know, was genuine. Um, it's interesting because a lot of friends of mine and, and people have done some research about this, and Ed Lorraine Warren had an assistant named Paul Bartz who was there that night of March 6, 1976, and he actually was wearing a flannel shirt, and uh, had his hair, his dark you know, hair, parted in a similar manner. If you look at that photograph up close, it appears that whoever is peering around that corner, whether it be a spirit or whether it be a person, is wearing eyeglasses. Uh, I guess you could say it's luminescent eyes, but uh, it looks like because the camera, there were hundreds of photographs of that exact same hallway that were taken. Uh, there was a camera on a timer uh, that was set up by a gentleman named Gene Campbell, who was a photographer, hired by the Warrens there that night, and that camera was taking photographs rapidly. Uh, you know, on a, it was on the timer and taking hundreds of photographs of this entire, of this second floor hallway. And so peering around this corner, it appears to be, you know, a, what looks like a little boy very similar to one of the DeFeo children, which has been said, and has been said by George Lutz in lectures, and, uh, you know, I, I know that at least from what it appears that George believed that was genuine, and, and Danny has also said that he believes that is genuine. Um, the gentleman I mentioned, uh, Paul Bartz, it looked very similar to him. And if you look at closely, you can see that through the bars of the stairway, it looks like he's wearing a flannel shirt. Mm -hmm. So 
you have to, you have to ask yourself, you know, what what's more likely here? I would go with the latter and think that it's actually one of the you know the, the assistant to the warrant or someone in the house at the time. But the people who were in the house claim that that you know they they believe that that's uh, evidence of some sort of paranormal activity, uh, which is interesting. It's definitely a chilling photograph, no matter what. <laughs> but also, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the uh, the moose head photograph. Are you guys? Familiar with that photograph as well? Uh, I'm not sure, but if I if I look at it, I might be once I see it. But uh, tell everybody about, well, there was about that. A, there was a photograph of Lorraine Warren uh, standing with two of the investigators, um, and it's, a, it's basically a wide shot of what the, the sunroom, like the porch room, uh, in the front of the house. And there was George had a moose head that was up on the mantel above the bar, I believe. And um, so this is up on the wall, and and in the in the actual moose head, the hair near the antlers, it looks like what appears to be an apparition of uh, Padre Pio, who was a saint. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with who that is, but um, he's actually referenced in the film uh, by Lorraine Warren. Right, yeah, she had the, the hair. Correct, correct, yeah. And that was the actual relic that she was carrying at the time during the investigation in that photograph. So it's one of those things that, you know, she, they believe that there's an, an actual manifestation of Padre Pio in the house, in that photograph. And to me, it looks like, an, you know, either an antler or a part of Moosehead. <laughs> so it's, again, it's, it's all in what you believe. And it's just like anything else with the paranormal in, in this case, you know, it's all uh, perceptive. Well, and that's the problem is when you're going into a spot where you're expecting it to be haunted or you're expecting the activity to take place your mind kind of makes that leap in logic uh, immediately when something looks out of place. Well, I've always felt that about what, you know, George saying that this was, this was that, you know, showing that picture uh, in an, a lecture with a, against a picture of, I believe it was John DeFeo, um, you know, showing John DeFeo, the, you know, the young boy, the young DeFeo boy, uh, with the, the ghost boy photograph trying to show, you know, you know, kind of wowing the audience in the sense that this is, you know, it's evidence of the paranormal. So, it does make you wonder if it, you know, it's, you're trying to show that this was a genuine thing. I, I just don't, you know, I don't believe the, the uh, photograph is a genuine uh, paranormal nature, but I could be wrong. You know, I wasn't there. I mean, I, I've shown the same photograph in lectures myself. I, I do, I actually uh, have a lecture that I, I do around here that traces the similarities between the Amityville case and the Lizzie Borden case. Uh, you know, just oh, that's com interesting. comparing a couple of different dysfunctional families, but uh, right. and when I show that photograph up there, you know, it's it's immediately met with <gasps> right. before you even take right. a few seconds to to start explaining what it could be. You know, it just has that emotional punch because people are looking for the physical evidence because we never actually got physical evidence in the Amityville case. Right, and and certainly, I mean, the people. Uh, well, in the day and age that we live in now, where we have, you know programs like Ghost Hunters and Paranormal State and things, you know, where people are recording EDPs and, you know, a very high-energy type of atmosphere. You know, our film was very much, obviously, psychological-based, but, you know, it was, it was less interested in trying to prove those things because there, there was nothing, there is no way to prove any of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is no way to prove. I would have loved, like I mentioned so many times, I would love to have had uh, Christopher come on and, and get his story. And originally, that is what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, uh, compare and contrast and, and, you know, get both of them to speak, if not all three kids. Um, so my only hope is that Christopher either does come forward or just lets this entire, you know, is able to move past this. And I hope that for Danny as well. Well, one ex extremely hard thing to let go. And I don't think they'll totally be able to do that. One of the problems for with Christopher for letting go of that is that it's it's still plaguing him to this day. He He feels like there's still some sort of... Uh, force or entity that that's around him even now, and that it's right. affecting his life. And, and I, I get the feeling that Danny doesn't feel the same way about it. Uh, you know, there's obviously there's the emotional uh, effect of it, and from the years of of having to deal with it. But uh, it doesn't seem like he feels like he's a, a victim of any kind of paranormal attack right now. Well, no, I wouldn't say that's the case for Danny. It, you know, it all has to do with your belief in it. I mean, if you believe this wholeheartedly, certainly things may have more of a chance to manifest themselves in that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess that's why I mentioned, you know, I, I, would, I would hope um, that they're able to let go of it in one way or another. And in, in many ways, this film was Danny's way of doing that. I mean, he, he could have come out 
Palestinians done this 25 years ago, you know, when he was you know much younger. You know, one has to wonder why now. Um, you know, he's a, he's a you know a regular guy, a blue collar guy uh, in the Whitestone area, and, and it's just a you know it's an interesting um, interesting interesting perspective. You know, he came he came to me, you know, and I was you know I, I you know relatively much younger than I am now at the time when I first started this. <laughs> let's put it this, let's put it that way. But uh, you know, I was just someone who was very very passionate about the story and and wanting to do something. Uh, doing it the right way, using real witnesses who were there and, and not, you know, venturing into this whole uh, third-party witness type of scenario that I mentioned before, which, you know, it's, it's a shame to see this being, this happening so much with this case. Well, um, I mean, you, it was a unique opportunity to get, you know, the perspective of somebody who was actually there at the time. And, and you mentioned him being a blue-collar guy. I mean, he's a gearhead. You know, you can tell that he, you know, right. he loves working on cars and trucks, and and uh, and he's a, a hell of a guitarist too. From the the different clips you put in the film, uh, so I mean, he probably, you know, travels in circles where uh, he doesn't really want to be talking about this to those type of people, and he probably gets a lot of uh, guff from some of his friends and, and acquaintances over this kind of thing. So he really is putting himself out there, uh, and, and right. Kind of going back and putting himself out there just as he was in the seventies, you know. You worked hard right. to, to build yourself away from being who you identified yourself with as a kid and then you're getting dragged back into that. So he obviously right. had to in get so this many way ways. Out it's it's like a, a fatal attraction for for Danny. Mm-hmm. And I felt that I, it seems to be the same way for Chris or at least it appears that way. You know. I, I don't know what I would do if, if you know, if I you know if I was in that position, you know. At, you know, in my adult life, if I if I want to, you know, move forward and tell a story about something, you know, I now I would say I'd probably let it go and not want to be, you know, live with that label. But to me, he'd say the same question. You know, I one of my first questions was why now. He answered by telling me, you know, that he wanted to give a, the answer to his children, but also that he's been living with this label so long it didn't matter, you know, now. So it does it does show you that the therapist even asked him in the film. Do you see yourself as the Amityville guy? And he says, "Yeah, because I am the Amityville guy." Right. And you know, it's one of the most tragic lines that he actually drops in the film. But to me, one of the most revealing too is that he says that you know he's uh, you're talking to uh, Danny Daniel's bodyguard, mm. which in many ways shows that he's protecting you know the ten year old that's somewhere still inside of him. Which really shows itself throughout the as the film progresses. So, again, this, these things kind of reveal themselves in his character as the film went on, and um, you know, it is, it's in many ways extremely tragic and sad. And that, for me, is the real Amityville horror. And it less about, you know, certainly about the paranormal events that happened or didn't happen, or the effect that it's had on them and the scars that it's left behind. And it, it really has been, uh, sounds like it's been horrific for him. But, you know, I can't let you go, Eric, without asking you about the uh, claim that he makes in the film that he was demonically possessed and, and had to undergo exorcisms. And that, uh, mm-hmm. that, that even seemed to have caused some tension in, in that line of questioning as well. But, uh, I mean, how much can you put in, in, into, how much thought can you put into what he's saying there? I mean... If that's true, then that takes us beyond uh, what we think that the Amityville Horror Hauntings might have been. And, and maybe it does go along with what Ronnie DeFeo and, and Jackie Barrett have been claiming, that there was some sort of demonic entity uh, involved in this, had it also taken control of Danny at some point in his life. Right. I mean, I found it, you know, as with many of the claims, I found it, you know, interesting. I found it difficult to accept that wholeheartedly until I hear it from other sources as well, oh, really? uh, namely Chris, namely from Christopher. I mean, I believe that Danny believes what he's saying there. Um, I don't think that he's fabricating. I know that it has been, it has been said to me uh, that you know the kids were left uh, in a mission uh, in a church uh, during which George and Kathy uh, were on a, a tour for the original uh, book and movie. See, uh, but how can you do that as a parent if you endure something like right. that, where your parent, where you right. felt like your children's lives are in jeopardy, and if you believe any part of the John Jones books at all, and and this this horror followed them to California, why would you leave your children? I would think you'd want to have them around you nonstop. You know, I couldn't answer that question. Right. You know, it was it was something that you know, 
I know Danny said that the move to San Diego at the time was for family therapy, you know, to get themselves away from New York, to get away, as far away from this as possible. And I know George has also said that as well. Um, so in many ways, you know, you have to wonder, yeah, how, how, at least from my perspective, I don't know if I could ever leave my children behind, you know, very shortly after living through this situation, they had to have been very comfortable with, um, you know, the people in this church. But apparently, according to Danny, there was all kinds of abuse and, 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 uh, all kinds of, you know, apparently he was uh, undergoing an exorcism, according to him. But uh, Danny has, it, my suspicion is, Danny has the tendency to exaggerate certain elements of his story. And at least that's in the theatricality that he has in his, in his stories. Um, and I can't pinpoint which one, because like I said, I would be interested to see what Christopher says about that, uh, him being exercised, this type of thing. But who knows? I mean, it's, it's Danny's word, so it's all for us to debate now. Well, I know Christopher has listened to the show uh, in the past, and if he's listening to this episode, you know, definitely get in touch with either me or, or with Eric. And, you know, and I, I just, I think that not that you want to spend more years of your life dealing with the Amityville story. I mean, but uh, I could see a scenario where you make a, a follow up film where Christopher gets the chance to sit in front of the camera and, and share his own story. Right. Well, we, you know, I, I am open to Christopher uh, coming forward, and so. Anything's possible for sure. So I'll be interested to speak with him at, at some point when he's ready to. All right, well, and it, I was reading your bio at the beginning of the show, and it says that you do have some, uh, some upcoming projects. What are you working on next? You know, it's, it's kind of in it's another documentary feature project. I have several things going on, but it's in such a, an infancy stage right now. It's kind of a sensitive, because I'm working with different uh, uh, people that are involved. It is, uh, a very, it is in a haunting case, but it is in the... Um, uh, UFO phenomena realm. Actually. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, so it'll be uh, interesting to uh, a little bit of an interesting switch, but well, also very much from a humanistic perspective, just as you know, my Amityville horror was. Um, so that's kind of my niche: is kind of humanizing and, and presenting witness-based stories in a cinematic and you know a more of a rich, textured way. Well, I wish my uh, my regular uh, second co-host was in here tonight, Matt Moniz. He's he's been working action cases for uh, for over 30 years and he used to work closely with Bud Hopkins and uh, wow he's, he's, well that's interesting so he might be somebody that you want to talk to somewhere down the line for sure yeah you have to uh, shoot me an email or something for Absolutely. sure Absolutely, that's that's fantastic I'd love to come back on when uh, things get rolling here oh we'd love to have you and, and thank you so much for joining us tonight and for for actually taking the time to to allow Danny to tell his story uh, in his own words without having to worry about if it has those, you know, Hollywood Amityville overtones that we've become so used to. To, to get the raw story like that, uh, it definitely changed right. my mind and, and made me realize that, you know, these three kids that went through this, they're, they're just people. They're not characters in a book or a film. That's right. And you know what? Finally, finally, that's been done. And I'm glad to have been the one to do that. However, it's a shame it's taken this long. Right. <laughs> For, for someone to present it, you know, in, at least in my perspective, the right way and, you know, do some justice to the story. And it's been drugged through the mud by Hollywood, and that's unfortunate. And that being said, uh, you'll be re-releasing the film as My Amityville Horror 3D coming up next summer, right? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> no, that's not. That won't be happening over my watch anyway. <laughs> uh, I think there is another. There's rumors of another 3D one coming out, so. Yeah, it's it, it just, it never went, that's for sure. Uh, but, uh. Amityville train keeps going into 2013 and beyond, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, I guess, you know, at some point it stops being your story and starts becoming, uh, you know, American folklore. And I think that's something that has been part of what the Lutzes have had to deal with. Absolutely. And now it's, it seems to be living within Danny himself, which was very evident to me, and that was part of, part of what the film portrays. So we're actually working on a, a little behind-the-scenes piece right now for the uh, Blu-ray and DVD that's going to be released by IFC Films coming up here. Oh, excellent. I believe this summer. So there'll be a little bit more of an insight to look forward to when that uh, comes out. So and maybe even, something to look forward to. Maybe even some of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, outtakes where we actually did kick your ass for some of the questions you were asking. <laughs> well, we do have actually an interesting clip. If you have a, a sec, we have an interesting clip of... Um, when we were out front of the house, actually, uh, someone had a 70, a, a little Canon 70, um, you know, camera rolling. Uh, when uh, one of the owners of the house at the of the t at the time, when we were doing that opening shot of Danny standing, you know, smoking a cigarette in front of the house, mm -hmm. out comes the owner of the house, 
and demands we turn the camera. But of course, we had permits to shoot there on the street. We weren't on the lawn or anything like that. And and uh, you know, the owner of the house comes out and yelling at me, you know, what are you doing out here with this huge camera? You know, we were shooting on the red one. You know, it's enormous. You know, cook lens in the front of it. And, you know, so it was clearly wasn't a home video thing going on here. And uh, so, you know, I'm trying to calm the guy down a little bit. And Danny turns to him and, and says, "My name is Daniel Lutz, and I am the Amityville Horror." And, and back <laughs> off, you know. <laughs> so it was pretty funny. Uh, and he turned around and went and right back to, inside, right? Right. Well, kind of it, you know. And you could see the the gentleman kind of waving the camera to turn the camera off. So it's kind of one of those funny uh, clips. That I wish I could show, but you know, I don't want to identify. Maybe we'll just fuzz his face out or something. Right. <laughs> so, but it's, you know, there's been there's been so many stories. I could probably read a book called My Amityville Horror about my experience. <laughs> well, if you do, we'd love to have you back on to discuss it. <laughs> right. All, All right. right. We will definitely talk to you when your next film is uh, is out there. Thank you so much for joining us, and and everybody no can keep up to date with the film at, uh, at amityvillemovie.com. Great. Thanks so much. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Eric. Have a great night. All right, bye. All right, that is Eric Walter. He is the director of the film My Amityville Horror. And if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It's available on demand. Comcast has it. Verizon has it. It's available on all the video on-demand services online. And, of course, there's screenings around the country. Go to amityvillemovie.com, which is also linked up on spookysouthcoast.com. That about does it for tonight. Uh, but we will be back next week. Uh, we'll be talking more about the world of the paranormal. Stay tuned. Follow us on SpookySouthCoast.com. Follow us on Twitter, at SpookySC. You can also read my blog on WBSM.com, and also linked up on SpookySouthCoast.com as well. We'll, you know, we'll offer some different perspective of the topics that we cover and the topics that are coming up. Some interesting paranormal news up there. Matt Costa, I'd like to invite you to kind of share some of the stories that you've been putting on Twitter uh, and maybe do some blog posting uh, on the blog as well. Yeah, sure. And, uh, of course... That's where we're going to be putting the, the video YouTube archive and the audio as well. So we'll be back next week with more Spooky South Coast. The station the South Coast turns to for local news, talk, weather, and sports. WBSM New Bedford, AM 1420, WBSM. From ABC News, I'm Chuck Severson. A snowshoer remains missing after a pair of avalanches on Granite Mountain an hour east of Seattle. In just the past hour, the search for him was called off the night. King County Sheriff Sergeant Kathy Larson says weather conditions have worsened to the point that continuing the search puts the rescue teams in harm's way. Larson describes the severity of that avalanche. 30 feet wide. Eight feet deep and about a quarter mile long. A second avalanche occurred a few miles away. That one trapped 12 people. All have been accounted for. One woman sustained non-life-threatening injuries. Rich Petschke, ABC News, Seattle. American scientists are on the ground in China, worried about the changes in this latest strain of the bird flu. There are 49 confirmed cases, 11 deaths. No explanation yet of this latest case, says ABC News Chief Health and Medical Editor Dr. Richard Besser in Hong Kong. Seven years old. How did one little girl in Beijing come down with a virus from Shanghai? Was it from her parents who work with live poultry? Or was it from something else entirely? Beijing is hundreds of miles away from the outbreak we've been following. After urging leaders in Beijing to get tougher with North Korea, Secretary of State John Kerry is now flying to Tokyo, the final stop of his Asia trip with the BBC's Martin Patiences. The authorities are stationed Patriot missiles uh, around the capital with orders to shoot down any North Korean rocket, which, if fired, is more than likely to head in Japan's direction. It's also